Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to ask how can HR teams in the social sector enable better mental health and well-being? My name is Bogdan Tiganov. I'm the head of content community at Cypher. Cypher is a specialist provider of SaaS, HR, payroll, recruitment and learning software through our HCM platform, Cypher Connect. Cypher Connect is designed to provide a frictionless people experience across an organization's entire employee lifecycle. Also enables seamless integration, not only with Cypher's own solutions, but also to an ecosystem of specialist third-party tools using our modern API technology. Happy to say that joining me today is Alison Smith, the interim CEO, director, and lead consultant for Roots HR, and Gwen and West, head of people at Cypher. Welcome. Um, just before we start, just going to quickly go over the agenda for today's webinar. Um, so we're going to start with looking at the importance of good mental health and well-being, the current landscape of mental health and well-being within the social sector, the importance of the role of the line manager, steps to enable good mental health and well-being that can be taken by organisations, line managers and individuals, and resources and support. And just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be emailed to you tomorrow. That's the uh, 15th of October. Um, and just before we get on to the main presentation, we're just going to start off with a quick poll. Um, Alison and Gwenon, I don't know um, how, whether you've seen a, a sort of a rise in the employee assistance program uh, recently or, or changes in, in, in how people have kind of uh, started to adopt that more. Yeah, thanks Bogdan. Um, we have, as a sort of consultancy working in the, the social sector, we've certainly seen an increase in our clients looking at employee well-being and um, as part of that considering if they don't already have uh, one in place an employee assistance program. So I certainly think that um, the sort of prevalence of, of employee assistance programs is definitely um, on the rise. Yeah, I'd definitely agree, um, especially when we've all been quite remote and in lockdown, um, just getting a lot more people requesting, whether, you know, whether we have an EAP in place and, you know, just trying to find different ways of helping themselves. So definitely I've seen an increase in it internally. Mm, yeah. I think as well, sort of employee assistance programmes, I think they're a lot more cost effective than than some organisations might uh, have previously perceived. So I think even for smaller organisations in the sector, it's an affordable um, sort of um, benefit, if you like, that that they seem to um, to be able to introduce. Yes, you definitely find that it actually usually gets bolted on to another benefit. So if you've mm. got form of insurance they usually bolt on an EAP program onto that yeah 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 so as you can see from the from the results there you're absolutely spot on um 78 mm. percent of people saying yes um, yeah they do have an EAP in place yeah um so yeah. I'm just going to hide that the results now um and then it's over to you Alison lovely thanks Thanks, Bogdan. Um, if we could move on to the, the first slide. Um, so thank you. Uh, as I say, I'm Alison. I'm the um, interim CEO, director and lead consultant at Roots HR, and we're a specialist consultancy for HR services in the um, social sector. Obviously, well-being, um, when we think about well-being, I want to start by sort of looking at, at, at definitions. I think in the past, um, well-being for employers has probably focused on thinking about their employees' physical health. Uh, and I think we have to be very mindful that well-being is more than just the avoidance of becoming physically sick. I think it's a much broader construct. Um, and what we're typically looking at is our physical, mental and our social health. So those kind of relationships um, and the, the sort of the, the social um, part of our lives, as well as sort of our mental health and our physical health. So it's this much broader construct than just a physical um, well-being and overall our well-being is, is influenced by a range of factors and there's a number of them on screen there you know our health so again our physical health security which could be not just physical security but things such as financial security you know relationships 
um, so this, these sort of social factors, what we might perceive as perhaps our purpose, or if we think that we're perhaps lacking in purpose within our life, and the sort of the environment that's that's around us. So there's a whole range of factors that influence our our well-being. And I think traditionally, you know, sort of well-being strategies or programmes within organisations were very much focused on physical health. Um, but I think prior to the pandemic, certainly, I think there was a recognition um, of the importance of looking at mental health as part of our well-being as well, and an inclusion of sort of mental well-being strategies within organisations. And the reasons I think employers look to do this is that obviously if employees are physically and mentally able, they tend to be more willing to contribute and likely to be more engaged at work. And typically that makes for a workplace which is seen as more productive, potentially attractive to um, uh, job applicants and a corporately responsible place to, to work. But positive well-being can be a benefit outside of the organisation as well. It can benefit the local community and more broadly the country as a whole, because, um, you know, typically thinking that well people may require less support from health or, or social um, care services. So it's really important that we're aware that, you know, well-being, we're talking about more than a physical construct. And the session that we're going through today has obviously got a clear focus in regards to mental health and, and well-being. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So when we talk about mental health, um, you know, we all have mental health, just as we all have physical health. And how we feel can vary, um, you know, from good mental health and well-being to experiencing difficult feelings or emotions to, you know, severe mental ill health. And when we think about our mental well-being, that's typically our ability to sort of cope with day to day stresses um, of life. So some of those factors that will influence our, our mental health and mind, who I'm sure you're all um, very aware of, refer to sort of mental well-being as being a dynamic mental state. Um, so typically individuals who've got good mental well-being are able to feel, express a range of emotions you know, feel engaged with work, that in itself can impact on um, productivity. They can feel confident in themselves. And as we said, able to cope with sort of stresses of everyday life and the ability to adapt in times of, of change and uncertainty. But as it's this dynamic state, it's fluid, it's a fluid state and it can vary. So we can have um, perhaps good mental health and mental well-being, um, but we can have other days, weeks or months when perhaps um, we're through some of those uh, influences, health, security, relationship, etc., that we may be experiencing um, poor or declining mental health or well-being. So it's this constant sort of um, fluid state. It's never typically static. It's very dynamic um, in, in respect of, uh, of our mental health and well-being. If we move on to the next slide, what we've got on this slide is some of the sort of top causes of mental ill health at work. And this comes from um, a CIPD survey done this year in regard to health and well-being at work. Now, there are some um, key issues that came through as a result of the coronavirus pandemic here in some of the causes of poor mental health at work present. But what we typically see is that Key causes, workload, so somebody experiencing a very heavy or increasing workload, management style, so their line manager and the management style that they engage is a top cause of poor mental health at work. Um, and we're probably, as HR professionals, all aware that that, you know, line managers and management style can have a big influence in regard to employee retention as well. But there are some specific um, challenges that have come about as a result of the coronavirus pandemic as well. So changes to work, home working, the impact that home working perhaps has had on work life balance, um, all uh, things that we've experienced over the past sort of 18 months during the, the pandemic. 
But there are also non-work related factors which can obviously impact on our mental health. Um, as we've talked about relationships, so our social health, so family or personal relationships, our physical health, so thinking about our um, perhaps habits around sleep, diet, um, anxieties, uh, you know, again, from physical health, thinking about COVID-19 and also issues such as, as financial security. So these are all factors that can influence our, our mental health and impact on us um, in regards to, to work. If we can move on to the next slide, please, we're going to just start to look at the, the sort of the landscape in regard to the impact of, of mental health. And prior to the pandemic itself, um, you know, mental health was being recognised as a significant cause of absence from work. It's actually the most common cause of long term sickness absence in the UK. And in 2019, 2020, there were 17.9 million working days lost in the UK due to work related stress, depression or anxiety. So that's an average of sort of 21.6 days lost per case. And obviously per case, we typically mean per employee. So 84% who feel stressed once a month have blamed that their work in some way. And what we're looking at is that depression or anxiety accounting for 55% of all working days lost due to work related ill health. And it's estimated that poor mental health costs UK employers around 33 billion to 42 billion pounds a year. So sort of pre pandemic, there was this understanding that um, mental ill health was a significant cause of um, absence from work. But obviously there has been an impact over the last 18 months in regards to the coronavirus pandemic. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, what we're looking at here is just the overall impact of the pandemic on the, the social sector itself. And I'm sure that we can all kind of look at these uh, impacts and um, kind of, you know, sort of flesh them out with our own experiences uh, over the past sort of 18 months within our own organisations. So if we think about at the first stage, you know, right back sort of February, March time, 2020, um, and for a few months there, obviously organisations were having to respond or react very, very rapidly to, to coronavirus. Um, you know, for some organisations within the social sector, this would have included adaptations or changes in the way that services were provided. Um, you know, we've had uh, worked with organisations who have provided social care services in GP practices. They've had to obviously really pivot very quickly to having people undertaking virtual um, uh, consultations and meetings with, with service users. Huge sudden loss of income for organisations as well, um, as a number of things such as fundraising events or trading opportunities will have ceased. The National Council for Voluntary Organisations, the NCVO, indicated that there was a loss of around four billion pounds across the not-for-profit sector between March and June 2020 itself because obviously of the um, very restricted first lockdown that we went into. And obviously many health and social care services have seen an increase in demand for some services, sometimes directly supporting NHS staff and also having to deal with things such as the shortage of PPE. We now tend to think that organisations are typically in some form of recovery mode. So obviously demand for services, um, particularly perhaps things such as food banks, community groups, health and social care remains high. There are still um, challenges that remain in regards to funding, um, you know, 71% of social sector organisations um, remain concerned about the loss of funding and have had to reduce their reserves, according to the NCVO. And we have seen large um, organisations such as Age UK and Macmillan, who have restructured and made redundancies. So there are issues with this balance of 
very high demand for services and um, challenges or restrictions in regard to funding that remain. And also some parts of the sector, you know, particularly health and social care, are struggling with labour shortages. And I think it was on the news again I saw last night in regards to the concerns of the number of vacancies within, um, you know, the, the care sector. So we've got this really high demand for service, issues in regard to um, labour and the accessibility of labour in some parts of the sector and obviously some issues in regards to um, to funding um, or access to uh, to finance. So it's been a real challenging 18 months and it remains challenging within the sector and I'm sure as sort of HR people working within the sector we can all recognize um, what our organizations have gone through in this response and recovery phase um, and we can all recognize the involvement that we've had to have in regards to supporting that response and that recovery but also add in you know some of the additional things that we've um, typically had to deal with as well you know none of us in February 2020 knew what furlough was or um, you know the job support scheme that, that never came into play so you know we've had to adapt and learn very quickly some of these things at the same time as supporting the organization and obviously you know there may well have been other factors in regards to our own sort of relationships um, health security etc that may have been um, impacting on on us at the time if I think back to again perhaps the the first lockdown um, you know I, I live by myself so obviously there was a huge impact um, on myself at that point in terms of not only um, how busy things were at work but obviously a, a sort of sense of, of isolation of not being able to meet with people um, and also my mom was going through some treatment for breast cancer at the time so obviously really challenging um, you know things that were happening for me personally as well as within work um, so it was a really sort of you know particularly challenging um, time so if we can move on to the next slide please um, what we need to think about is that this is still a real significant concern within the sector. So, you know, a survey undertaken by Ecclesiastical um, very recently, last month, evidence that 66% of employers were really concerned about staff burnout. And many of them see it as the second most serious challenge to their organisation over the next 12 months. And obviously an increase, you know, 44% of respondents reported an increase in mental health concerns and 56% um, saying that COVID-19 had exacerbated mental health issues in the sector. So there's a recognition of what people within the sector have been through over the past 18 months and that leads to a real concern within the sector in regard to mental health and poor or declining mental health in particular. So it's really important that we can look at how we can support people with poor um, or declining mental health and also how we can work to enable better or good mental health within our organisations. So if we can move on to the next slide please. I think for us as HR professionals it's really important to recognise the importance of the role of the line manager in both um, managing poor mental health, managing um, perhaps sickness absence as a result of that and also enabling um, good or better mental health. We saw earlier on in the presentation that poor management style is one of the main causes of work related stress. So obviously our managers are really key um, in regard to their management style as to how their direct reports um, are feeling at the time. We can all think about when we've been managed um, by a line manager who's been fair, consistent, able to build a good relationship with you. It does have a huge impact in terms of how you feel at work and perhaps also your um, confidence in that individual and your confidence in being able to raise issues or concerns with that individual. 
So line managers and their management styles are, are really key. Line managers are also a gatekeeper to organisational sources of stress and well-being. So they can act as a gatekeeper to um, essentially not allow the transfer of perhaps sources of stress or well-being into their team, you know, perhaps organisational pressures, issues of staffing or shortages, you know, they can kind of act as a gatekeeper to not necessarily pass on those stresses to their direct reports. And of course, managers have a significant role in identifying and managing um, people management issues, which includes managing absence or or ill health. So um, for us as HR professionals, it's really important that we can ensure that managers um, have the skills to be able to spot the signs of poor mental health, to have well-being conversations with their direct reports and to be able to provide um, appropriate support or signpost individuals to appropriate support. So I think there's some areas that we um, need to think about in terms of enabling the line managers within organisations to, um, to, to deal with. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So it's really important that managers are aware of some of the early signs of, of poor mental health. Um, some of those signs appear on screen here. Somebody appearing tired, anxious or withdrawn, increases in sickness absence or being late for work, um, changes in the standard of their work, their focus, being less interested, um, perhaps changes in their behaviour or, or mood. And also this bottom bullet point, presenteeism or leaveism. And um, again, the CIPD in that 2021 Health and Wellbeing at Work survey indicated an increase in presenteeism and leaveism um, during the pandemic. And presenteeism is really about people continuing to work when they're actually unwell. And I think a rise of presenteeism may well have been um, or could be potentially attributed to perhaps more people working from home. And this view that it's easier to continue working from home, you know, if you if you happen to be unwell. And leaveism is around people. Um, working outside of their normal working hours, so working much longer hours, or perhaps using annual leave for periods of sickness absence. So rather than taking or, or, or going off sick from work, actually using annual leave to cover that period of, of absence. So some of those are some of the signs. I think what it's really important is that Noticing some of these signs doesn't mean that you should make any assumptions about, you know, mental health problems or declining mental health that people may have. But actually, it's a good way of noticing when perhaps um, you should check in with somebody and start a conversation about how they're, they're coping. So I think it's important that line managers within our organisations are aware of these signs and that they're aware of um, the fact that actually this may, need that they, may mean that they should be checking in with that particular individual. It's really important that they don't make assumptions, but that actually the first step is to, is to have a conversation with that individual. Thanks, Alison. And uh, I think at this point, we're just going to tie into that point um, and launch another poll question. Um, so just launching that now. Thank you. So, yeah, this this question is about, um, I guess, for, for, for us as individuals attending today. Um, are we happy to talk about our mental health and well-being with our line manager? Um, you know, I think that um, there has been certain level of, of stigma in regards to mental health now, much of which I think is, is declining. I think there are many more conversations happening um, in regards to, to mental health uh, amongst the sort of the, the, the community within the society across the UK. But it's interesting, it's going to be interesting to see how that translates into work and whether um, in work we are happy to potentially talk about our mental health and well-being with our with our line managers. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to know actually, because obviously as HR professionals, we should obviously know those those sort of pathways that we should be able to have those mm -hmm. open and nice conversations and that we hope that we breed that sort of culture within our business, but it's not always 
necessarily yeah. the case for HR because you, you you know we are you know who do who do HR go to for HR matters type of thing <laughs> you know is, is it you know are we are we reporting into the CEO are we reporting into someone in finance or do we actually have a a, a director or someone within the board or um, senior mm. management who is actually on board with the sort of people matters really so it'd be interesting to see what mm. this result would be actually mm. okay well let's share the results oh mm-hmm. yeah good <laughs> yeah that's good that's good i think i think um yeah that's probably higher than i would expect if i was talking to non-hr professionals yeah. i think there would still perhaps be a certain level of stigma i think it's good that um, you know, as HR professionals, what we're saying there is that 60% of us would feel able to talk to about, um, sorry, to talk to our managers about mental health and and well-being. And I think that's that's really great. You know, there's a, a level of, of individuals that are unsure, 30%, that's fine. I think the fact that only 10% don't feel that they would be able to have that conversation, you know, that they're able to say no, I think is is really good. I do expect if we weren't HR professionals that actually um, the number of people saying yes would probably be slightly lower because I I think that there is still a stigma around talking about mental health at work. And so I think, you know, as HR professionals, you know, the fact that we're indicating here we're more likely to be able to talk to our managers about mental health and well-being. Is great and I think we need to be able to role model that to other people within the organization including the line managers yes great I think if we if we steer that you know if, if we're seen to be talking about mental yeah. health issues more it, it sort of breeds that culture doesn't it it does absolutely Absolutely. And I know sort of previous research has said that, you know, around 41 percent of employees would fear talking to their manager about, um, you know, their well-being or their mental health uh, out of fear of things such as jobs, job prospects or thinking that people would would feel less of them. Um, So I think it is really important that as HR professionals, we're able to to role model these conversations um, and to, you know, work with our line managers to enable them to have these conversations with their direct reports mm-hmm. okay just going to hide uh, the, the poll now lovely thank you and if we can move on to the next slide please and obviously what we are talking about is is really these conversations and in particular for, for us as hr professionals thinking about how we do enable our line managers to have regular well-being conversations with their direct reports but also if they do spot any of those um, signs that we had on the previous slide that they are able to have a check-in uh, you know a conversation with that individual to see how they're they're feeling and how they're doing and that can be a very difficult conversation for a line manager to have and to think about how they approach that conversation and in particular, understanding perhaps the stigma that there may still be, particularly in a workplace, to talk about mental health and well-being, how to allow that individual the space to truly open up to them. And I think one of the biggest ways that um, people, uh, you know, to get somebody to open up is to undertake some kind of self-reveal. So if a line manager is having a conversation with their direct report, um, you know, that the line manager is able to, to in some way self-reveal how perhaps they felt in a particular situation, perhaps impacts of things such as coronavirus, you know, the pandemic, the last 18 months on, on them. Um, you know, earlier on in this session, I talked about my experience during the first lockdown um, and, you know, other impacts, uh, you know, work and outside of work that um that were that were you know on my on myself so i think that kind of self-reveal can sometimes allow people the opportunity in the space to feel comfortable to talk about their own situations and then obviously there are prompts that again the bullet points that are on screen that can enable managers to um you know ask questions and to raise uh, concerns that they may have with the individual 
think it's really important that managers understand how to respond to disclosures and to know um, to advise people perhaps where they need to seek additional guidance that could be from yourselves as HR professionals um, to be able to support individuals in regard to any disclosure that they've made so what we want to do is to give managers the tools to be able to recognize signs to open up a dialogue with an individual in regard to those signs and if there is a disclosure or a concern that's raised in regards to perhaps poor or declining mental health or um, you know stresses at work that the managers understand the types of support that can be offered to individuals um, and also that they've got tools that are available to them to enable them to understand what support would help this individual because obviously we're all um, very different in regard to the jobs that we do our mental um, well-being the resilience that we have so things are always going to be discussed and agreed on a on a case-by-case -case basis but if we can move on to the the next slide please I think that there are um, a couple of great tools that particularly for managers provide a framework to some of these conversations and to be able to identify appropriate levels of support for individuals and that's the wellness action plans that are available from MIND and also a stress risk assessment. So obviously if somebody raises issues or concerns with regards to stress at work, you know, a stress risk assessment can help identify what are the causes, the triggers of those stresses and help you to discuss and agree um, ways at which those causes can be reduced or mitigated. And a wellness action plan really gives a framework for a conversation it allows the individual and the line manager to identify issues or concerns that the individual has and to again look at support that might be appropriate for them um, to identify um, triggers or issues that may happen at work so both of those the wellness action plans and the stress risk assessments are great tools for line managers to have um, you know it, to have an understanding of and to know how and when to use because they really enable and provide a framework for the conversation to be able to agree with the individual what support is required that will help improve um, perhaps or, or prevent any further decline in um, you know mental health or mental well-being for the individual um, that really allows for the individual to stay in work and to um, improve their sort of uh, well-being and mental health various various different things of support that could be agreed for individuals and I'm sure you'll all be aware of these some of them could be temporary some may be permanent things such as flexible working arrangements um, line managers uh, identifying if somebody's got into a habit particularly working from home of some unhealthy work habits like working long hours not taking breaks it could be that it's things such as access to counselling. Again, we referenced employee assistance programmes earlier. Many employee assistance programmes um, actually include some access to counselling. Um, you know, it could be regular wellbeing conversations with the line manager. But working through things such as the wellness action plans or stress risk assessments and conversations perhaps with yourselves or, or the line manager's manager, can really help to agree and identify support that could be put in place for, for individuals. Now, obviously, some of that support um, could have, you know, a, a larger impact on perhaps service delivery. So things such as changes to duties or um, flexible working arrangements. Um, but obviously, you know, you would look at this and agree this on a case by case basis, determining what's really um, reasonable for the organisation to do. Um, but obviously, you know, the purpose of, of trying to put this support in place is to 
improve the situation for the individual to enable better mental health and to hopefully mean that that is that the individual can can stay in work but obviously it may well be that actually when we're dealing and managing with mental ill health that we're talking about absence and periods of absence from work so if we can move on to the next slide please you'll all be aware that there's obviously a legal framework that sits around um you know sort of sickness absence from work and on um the sort of health of employees the health and safety at work act you know sets out that employers have a duty to protect the health safety and welfare of their employees and that includes mental health and, and well-being and under that legislation, you know, if an employee um, does disclose uh, poor mental health that's arising from work activities or stress that's arising from work activities, then there is a legal responsibility to assess that level of risk. So the stress risk assessment that we talked about and to put in place measures to control or mitigate that risk. Mental health conditions could also possibly be um, a disability under the Equality Act 2010. Um, and obviously, I'm sure you'll all understand um, the definition of a disability under the, the Equality Act. Obviously, if an employee is disabled, then the employer um, must make reasonable adjustments to support them um, in the workplace. And sometimes that can be reasonable adjustments to support them back into the workplace. But obviously those adjustments and what's considered reasonable will vary dependent on the specific circumstances, you know, the organisation itself. There's also, again, around um, in this legal framework, um, you know, responsibilities or duties that the employer has with regards to information and data. So again, if you're looking to seek medical guidance, perhaps from an occupational health advisor or GP, you may need to think about access to medical records. And obviously any information in regard to the individual's um, health is, um, you know, special category data. So we have to think about it in regards to um, the Data Protection Act and um, sort of UK GDPR. So there is a legal framework around this and I think it is important that managers have an awareness of that legal framework just so they understand what the duties and obligations are on the employer. If we can move to the next slide please. I think it's then important internally within our organisations to make sure that managers understand the importance of managing sickness absence within organisations. I very often have conversations with managers within client organisations where um, there are issues with um, sickness absence, whether it's related to um, mental health or not. Um, and a lack of understanding or a lack of awareness i should say perhaps that in managing absence you're not necessarily you're not questioning the genuineness of the illness but what you're looking to do is to manage the impact of the absence so that could be the impact of the absence on the organization as a whole on the individual's colleagues on clients or service users of the organization so it's a balance between wanting to support the individual in improving their health and well-being and to enable them to return to work but also to be able to manage or mitigate the impact of that absence on on others on you know service users team members etc so it's not about questioning the genuineness of the illness. If you are questioning the genuineness of the illness, that's an entirely different process. Um, but I think it's really important for managers to, to understand that, for them to understand what your organisational policies and procedures are. Um, so, you know, right the way through from notification, certification, when to seek medical guidance. Um, but also I think it's really important for managers to understand their responsibilities in regard to managing absence as well. You know, um, line managers, you know, their responsibilities are greater than just perhaps simply managing the delivery of a service or specific tasks. 
you know, their management of resources, you know, financial, whatever, also includes human resources. So, you know, the responsibility for the management of absence is really the responsibility of the line manager. You know, the role of HR within that is to really support, guide and, and advise. But I think it's really important that managers understand the responsibilities that they have and also understand that in managing absence, we're not questioning the genuineness of the illness, but managing the impact of that on on service users, clients, organisations. Thanks, Alison. And just wanted to say um, quickly um, a little bit about Cypher HR and how it can help you manage absence. Um, so Cypher offers a comprehensive absence management solution, and that's within um, Cypher HR. And this is for all employees, uh, managers, and HR. So employees can see who's off. So you know avoid any clashes in holidays, um, view remaining holiday balance, request holidays, uh, log absences, and also upload supporting documentations. Um, managers um, can check absence calendars and then view, verify, or decline absence requests, as well as monitor remaining holiday balances of their team members. Um, An HR can report on all paid and unpaid employee absence, configure approval uh, processes, automatically calculate the Bradford factor and reduce absence costs. Um, so overall, um, it is, as I said, quite a significant um, solution available, uh, which can help you manage your absence. Thanks, Pogden. That's really, really helpful. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. So again, I think, you know, as we said, the support that might be required for an employee who is um, perhaps off six, so absent from work because they're experiencing poor mental health, will vary according to their job, their personal situation, specific sort of condition and, and symptoms. But obviously, again, I think it's really important that your managers are aware of how they, what the organisational procedures are and how they should be managing that period of sickness absence. So when to seek additional medical guidance, um, how to agree phased return to work plans or reasonable adjustments that might be required. And also when people do return to work, that they're able to perhaps look at tools again, such as the wellness action plans or stress risk assessments, to be able to ensure that appropriate support is in place for the individual on a temporary or ongoing basis, and to be able to support, to monitor and support the individual during that period of their return to work. Um, you know, and I think this issue of regular well-being check-ins and conversations with people is, is really important. So again, just for managers in this process of managing absence, really important for them to understand how they would manage perhaps a longer term period of sickness absence, but also understand what support is available to them through yourselves, your organisational policies, etc. So if we can move on to the next slide then, please. So obviously once somebody is back into work or obviously um, if we're not looking at, at, at absence, but we're just looking at from an organisational perspective, wanting to enable um, you know, good well-being and good mental health within the organisation. There are a number of things that we can consider and, and things that are no cost or low cost to organisations. So at an organisational level, you know, we can introduce things like well-being strategies and perhaps have well-being working groups to pull together, um, you know, strategies that the organisation could introduce. Um, you know, that could include things such as employee assistance programs it could include things such as mental health first aiders perhaps having proactive health and well-being services available again such as virtual gps and flu jabs again sometimes they can be linked to employee assistance programs or other benefits that you may have within the organization as hr functions within the organization we can make sure that we have um, appropriate policies and procedures in place for example you know uh, around well-being around stress at work around um, sickness absence management that we're developing management capabilities so some of the things that we've talked about today 
that we support the communication of any organisational wellbeing strategies and, and opportunities. But also, again, I think it's really important that we're a good role model. So we've talked about um, and you've done the poll to indicate how you feel about talking about your mental health with your line manager. But I think we can role model those kind of behaviours and also role model some of the good working habits that that, um, you know, we want to be prevalent within our organisation. So making sure we're taking regular breaks, making sure we're not working long and unhealthy hours. Managers, obviously a real key part that managers play in this. Again, checking in regularly with employees, having these well-being conversations, similar to HR, you know, being a good role model tackling unhealthy work habits and not role modeling unhealthy work habits, managing workloads, you know, promoting well-being opportunities, you know, and signposting people to support and undertaking things like wellness action plans. And then for all of us as individuals, there are things that we can do to enable our own sort of good or better mental health. You know, if there are well-being opportunities offered by our employers, we can take those up. You know, if we are still working from home or hybrid working, making sure that we're not losing those connections with others, either outside of work or within work, you know, tools such as mindfulness, relaxation and breathing. So starting to look at what we can proactively do to manage our perhaps stress, improve our resilience, improve our physical health. So thinking about healthy habits around eating, sleeping, drinking and maintaining routines if we're working from home. So those are some of the things that an organisational and down to an individual level we can we can look at. So if we want to move on to the next slide, please. So just to finish off, this has just got some resources for managers. Um, some of these you may well be aware of from CIPD, Mind, Mental Health at Work Foundation, and organisations such as um, uh, St John Ambulance, ACAS, Health and Safety Executive. There are also some um, handouts and documents that are available to delegates attending the webinar today as well. So thank you. That's the end of my part of the presentation. That's brilliant, Alison. Thank you very much. It's an excellent presentation. Um, we have got a little bit of time now um, just to go over any questions that people might have. Um, so if you did have questions, do please ask them um, and we'll, we'll address them in this time. Uh, we've had a couple come in already. Um, what impact could hybrid working have on mental health at work? That's a really good question. Um, and I think it certainly could have an impact on, on mental health at work because I think the, there are two, two things that spring to mind there. One of which is people coming back into the organisation and back into the workplace and anxieties that there may be in regard to that, both you know, the logistics of working, the logistics perhaps of travel to and from work. Um, but I think also this, you know, again, this issue of working from home and trying to maintain connections and social cohesion as well as task cohesion um, with team members. So I think we have to be mindful of of, um, you know how we handle a return to the workplace for people and I think uh, making sure that anxieties are reduced as much as possible but also think about how we're managing a mixed or remote workforce and how we're engaging with people and that people who are working from home are still getting the same level of engagement with and time with their manager and colleagues as they would do if they're if they're in the office. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's that managing their expectations, isn't it, for when they're returning into the office, having those open conversations about, you know, what what they're fearing, what they're looking forward to, what what measures we need to be putting in place for them. Because it is everybody will be individual in that respect, and it's it, everybody has their own own little idiosyncrasies about what they want to be doing and what they don't want to be doing in an office, and and it's making sure that employees know what measures what safety measures you put in place what 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 we've been doing while while everybody's been away keeping people updated and again as you were saying it's that 
mixture of those people that are in the office and those people that are not in the office and how you balance that out because it is it's quite tricky balance that Mm, yeah definitely cool thank you um and next question is um how has cypher dealt with presenteeism and leaveism oh it's a good one (laughs) so um we do actually have um in our system, we have a, a actual code called holiday taken for sickness. So it just stops us hiding those sicknesses under the holiday banner. So obviously if a, an employee rings up in the morning and says, I'm really not feeling very well today, I don't want to take it as sick, but I'll take it as a holiday. The manager can then note that and so that that, that absence isn't hidden within the holiday um, coding so that we can then have a conversation with people saying, you've actually taken a lot of your holidays this year for sickness. Was that the right thing to do for your mental health? Because now you're not going to have many days holiday to be able to sort of recover and rest. So it gives us that visibility of what people are doing with their holiday. Um, And then the sort of presenteeism, again, we rely quite a bit on managers in that respect. So we do quite a bit of management training around managing absences. And one of those is questioning whether somebody should be actually at work if they are not feeling 100% is almost giving them that permission to be off it it, is that sort of sometimes I think people will have that conversation with the manager where they're saying I'm not really feeling very well but I'll come in almost hoping that the the line manager will say no take today off it's absolutely fine because you're then given that sort of permission to to take that time off so again it's reliance on the line manager and how they deal with employees when they're ringing in with that absence on that that very first day and and keeping those conversations going between the line manager and the employee is vital i guess there's also a kind of link to to the first question about um that kind of hybrid working and whether people might feel that because they're working remotely or you know in a kind of hybrid sense they might just feel well if I'm at home then you know I could be sick you know like I could carry on working yeah. through the sickness kind of thing so yeah. maybe that yeah. that influences that part of it as well it does and and in, it's only a line manager that could pick up on those sort of things because they're the ones that are actually having those conversations with them throughout the day and they, they can actually see that they're struggling they're not well and they're pushing themselves through that it is you know a, a line manager should be able to have that open and honest conversation with somebody saying look I really don't think you're well enough to be at work today. Take take the day off sick. Mm. Yeah, and I think that just highlights, like you said, the importance of the role of the line manager in all of these conversations. You know, they're really the person that's going to spot those behaviours and be in a position to um, to talk to the individual about them. Yeah, yeah, and they they know that they know their employees. They know what they're like when yeah. they're firing on all cylinders they know what they're like when they're not yeah and it it is it is giving them that permission to actually slow down or at least reduce the amount of workload that they're giving to them on that day if they can see that they're having a a really difficult day it's balancing their workload for them so as as you were talking before it's that being that gatekeeper being that protection for them they're the sort of Mm. umbrella over the top that's that's protecting them from the storm that's that's around them and if you can protect them as much as you possibly can that will help them recover yeah absolutely thank you and i think the next question ties in with that really so um what training should we provide managers to improve their awareness of mental well-being at work uh, and then equip them with the skills to manage uh, poor mental health mm. That's a good question. I think um, for me, it's about ensuring that managers understand their role in in, in this process and that they're given, um, if you like, knowledge and skills around things so they're able to spot signs. So as we've said, they're typically the person that's going to be in contact with their direct reports the most to be able to spot when somebody's, um, you know, demonstrating behaviours that don't seem to be normal and that could indicate that there's uh, a sort of an issue there with regards to that individual's um, stress or, or mental health. So I think it's about 
understanding the importance of their role, understanding um, the signs and being able to spot the signs, and then having, I think, the confidence and the capability of having conversations with individuals. I think that's really fundamental. And I think it's not just about having conversations with people when they are perhaps um, demonstrating poor or declining mental health. I think it's having well-being conversations regularly that's really important. And then I think that they understand the um, processes that are in place within your organisation for managing absence. Um, and again, that they know how to access support you know we quite often work with managers who they find managing sickness absence really tricky because you are dealing with a, an issue of ill health um, and they're not quite sure what to do so i think it's making sure they know the tools and the support that's available to them which could include obviously um, those people attending today as, as sort of HR professionals so that they know they're not alone in doing this that there is support that's available to them yeah I agree it's 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 around that giving them the confidence to have those conversations with their employees and giving them the tools behind them so uh, internally in Cypher we have what we call a well-being pack and um, that that allows um, managers to just draw down on different parts of that pack just to be able to have those conversations with employees but there's also there's there's a raft of videos and and guides out there you know especially from mind on 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 guiding managers on the sort of conversations they can be having but Alison is right it's having those conversations regularly so that you're not just picking it up when they're struggling you're having those conversations throughout the life cycle of their, of their life within 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 your business so it's you then get to know that person you know when they're doing well you know when they're doing bad and they they you've opened that communication up so that they can then feel that they can be quite open and honest with you about when they when they really are struggling and they need that little bit of support thank you um and i think we've got time for one more question um how would we go about developing um, a well-being strategy for our workplace? That's a really good question. And we've had um, some clients who, in looking to pull together sort of a well-being strategy, have had a, a couple of things influence that. They've set up working groups, so got some employees from different levels, different parts of the organization together um, to sort of start to understand perhaps where some concerns lie what some suggestions are for organizations going forward we've had clients who've done sort of surveys with staff as well um, so well-being surveys to again identify um, any issues of concern that there may be uh, to to start to put in place strategies to um, to mitigate those areas of concern so I think talking to people and understanding uh, what's happening in the workplace at the moment is really absolutely fundamental and as I say I think there might be different ways dependent upon the size, the nature of the organisation as to how you do that. But things like working groups, um, surveys could be a good a good starting point for that. Yeah, I agree. It's one of these things that you think that you could probably sit down and write a complete strategy yourself and 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 release it to the business. And it, and it will not be a good fit because it's your view of what what you feel that everybody wants. So it's definitely really really important to involve the employees what what is it that they feel that they need to to give them that that good well-being within the business so definitely working groups questionnaires surveys just involve the business in in what they want because if you just go ahead and just write it on your own it it's not going to be fit for purpose you're just doing a tick tick box exercise of just writing a strategy so definitely get the employees involved, get the main stakeholders involved. And 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 it's all it's got to fit within your culture of your business. So um, you know, talk talk to the business, see where the, the goals are going forward in the business, and then then you can just sort of take it from there and build build on it from that point there. And then you can start extracting data from places like Mind and they, there's all sorts of things out there on the internet that will give you guides on how to write a strategy or what 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 different businesses strategies are um, but again don't copy somebody else's because it won't fit, fit, fit your own business yeah 
Definitely. I mean, there's no one size fits all approach here. Um, it's very much bespoke, as you said, to your employees, your organisation. Um, so, yeah, no, no one size fits all, unfortunately. No, <laughs> I'll pick it up off the shelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both for the really in-depth answers uh, to the questions. And that's all we've got time for today. Um, but if you'd like to discover more about Cypher's people management solutions or Roots HR, opt in at the end to find out more using the exit survey um, and someone will be in touch. That survey will also ask you for a bit of feedback about today's broadcast, which will help us improve our webinars in the future. So do take a couple of minutes to fill it in if you can. Um, thank you for joining us today and we do hope to see you at another future Cypher webinar.